Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. How you doing, bro? Good, bro. So, uh, alhamdulillah. <laughs> Good, bro. Let's get out of business. <laughs> uh, so, I've got some Philly tea. Uh, I've also got Philly tea. No, as in, I, I, I got us some Philly tea. Yeah, that's why I'm holding one. Jazakallah <laughs> khairan. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. You, you've also well, got yeah, my. Yeah, that's what I was waiting for. Just wanted that on camera. Yeah, you want like, yeah, no. You've got, but also, you've also got my sugar. Um, Level Pre- preference, yes, correct. Yeah, I always get the big. light because look, I know, I know you can tell by looking at me, but <laughs> I'm an absolute unit. Yeah, you are. Yeah, so uh, light sugar on the Philly tea. Thank you yeah. very much, muchas gracias, mm. and uh, and wow. that's how we drink it. Yeah, although um, I have had the owner of Philly in this room, you were here in yeah, that very, on that very episode. That was momentous. Co- co-hosting that episode with myself, and the owner of said. Uh, said uh, establishment actually poured me tea he did man on my podcast that was, that was like an awkward uh, ask but you went through it anyway there's two people <laughs> i've seen him pour tea for yeah <laughs> <laughs> Shah Rukh khan yeah. and myself make of that what you there will there you go yeah. with no con- no further context needed yeah. I think. also both Shah Rukh khan and myself also both done ted talks oh yeah that that leads me to my <laughs> first question yeah yeah How's the TED Talk? I know you've done some content on it, but I don't think you've done anything since, right? Uh, Other than like, some, like no, I haven't done anything since. No. So what? Firstly, my main. But I feel I'll, like I've thrown it all so much on socials that I've calmed down for a minute. Okay, but I want to. I, I want to ask you like something indirectly about it though. No, no, no. You now you can ask me. But I'm just on Instagram. I was like just like yeah. posting those pictures and stories. Like. Okay, so I'm, I want to ask you like how it actually was. But ask before, me anything. But before that, what I'm interested in. TED Talk AMA. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm interested in. How nervous were you before? Because there's, there's there's public speaking and there's TED talk. Yes. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, it's a different level. So how nervous were you? Were you? And how did you man? How did you manage that? If or, or were you nervous? I was the most nervous I think I've been for a talk. Really? Yeah. And I've done uh, like five thousand people in an XL arena, oh. um, <laughs> West End and stuff like that. No, but I was interested yeah, to give context. Yeah, course, yes. um, and I was probably the most nervous. Yeah. Because and and this was only a hundred people. Yeah. The reason I was uh, I was the most nervous for this is because of what it meant. Um, also because obviously, yes, it's a hundred people in front of you, but it's 40 million people on YouTube. Yeah. And so Inshallah I wanted more. to get it right. And my strategy for it was, so, so that was, that's the answer because I was, I was very nervous. How did I handle it? Um, it's literally, it sounds, uh, I, I don't mean to say this in a, I won't, because what I was going to say might come across a bit shirky actually. I was going to, I was going to say is like, I love, I live for it, but, but which is not true. I don't live for it, but, um, I think all of us have a fitna. And that feeling, that, those nerves before you go on stage, it just, it really gets me going. Yeah. Quite, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> no, fair enough, man. You, bra- you embrace it. it. Yeah, yeah, you embrace I, it. I really enjoy it. And it, yeah. it's a very fearful feeling, but it's like, there's no, it's like, it's like being on the edge of a plane. Yeah. About to jump out as a uh, with a parachute. Don't know if it was like. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I also do know what that. You feels do, like. you, don't you? No, I'm but that, that I didn't enjoy. Uh, yeah. But this, I, I understand uh, what you mean by that. But like, do you, you, know what you, what I mean, you embrace bro? it, and yeah, uh, it's, it's a, the rush of it, the thrill of yeah. it, and then the feeling of after you've completed it. I can imagine. Was, yeah, and I imagine I've done nothing on your level, but I've done like wedding speeches. So I know, like, and like, um, just like, but wedding speeches are so nerve wracking. Yeah, I felt nervous. Yeah, I mean, to me, I did feel nervous, but obviously, I know it's just like you know, it's a little wedding. No, 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 wedding speeches. Are, wedding speeches are really nerve wracking. Yeah, and I know, like, I was nervous, but then once you get the first sentence out, it's just like, oh, okay, fine, it's fine. Yeah. Oh, I, oh, I didn't like burp in my first like syllable. I'm fine. Like, Why are wedding speeches so nerve wracking? I don't know, man. I think it's because in front of friends, of family. it's a tough crowd as well. Like it is people, a tough crowd. like. If people come to a talk, they want to talk. If people come to the wedding, they know it's going to be a talk, but they're not there for the talk, innit? So And they expect it to be funny, maybe? Yeah, they, that's, that's that's another thing. You, you kind yeah. of have to deliver a joke or two, yeah. uh, which I'm no stranger to. But You're no stranger to a joke or two. I'm not, I'm uh, not. But not the car you're when, when the pressure mounts and like there's an uncle in the back going, boo, he's like, yeah. oh. <laughs> I reckon you could tell a good joke under pressure. Um, I've, done, I've done a couple of jokes under pressure, but I'll tell you one time when it went a bit wrong, right? Because I've given like two. I gave one at an um, engagement, one at a wedding, and one at somewhere else, right? Small, small th- things, right? And the first two times I did it, I was really like, still nervous but confident. So I like re- memorized what I was gonna say, and I didn't have notes. And she went out and did it, right? And it went well. Th- I think it was the third time I did it. I had the same sort of, you know, bravado. Like oh, it's fine. I know what I'm gonna say. I've got these four jokes and four different stories. I'm gonna the worst thing you can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went out there, and I got, and I wasn't that nervous on this one because again, oh, yeah, I've done this before. And it will come quite quickly, like it's like three, like two years, right? 
got up there, literally forgot my first line. And the first line's quite important because it sort of sets up the joke that's going to come. And then I got up there and I was like, I had to quickly get a note out. And that was, I made it into a joke, but it was like, it wasn't a great start. The fact that you can make that into a joke is incredible. Oh, you've got no choice, man. Either that or just crumble. Innit? Well, well I, I, would, I would crumble. And I do crumble. Nah, if I forget I something, I, kind, I find it difficult. There were a few speakers at the event who messed up, mm. but they, they, they did it with so much eloquence that they, like you said, made a joke out of it, but in a really suave manner. Yeah. I would be like, I would freeze. I mean, I kind of did freeze for and a I second. But then, like, you know, after you freeze, like, you just, like, try to try and parlay it a little bit. But... Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't even imagine the pressure of a, of a TED talk. Like, it'll be at times a million. Well, I, I think the secret really is preparation. Yeah. And that sounds really cliche, but yeah. no matter how many times you do public speaking, um, that your superpower is in your preparation. Mm. Nobody, you know, you know people, I, I, I've spoken to some incredible public speakers. In fact, in prep for this, I was, um, I had a few one-on-ones with various different speakers. And um, one of them, some, uh, a, a guy I really look up to in this space and I, I was just grilling him and I was like, you know, um, how do you prepare? Uh, because I feel like it, um, that age old cliche, bro, prepare, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Yeah. And, um, and he's one of those individuals who's like, look, I know, I, I don't like, I don't script every word. Mm. And I said that I just feel like generally speaking, if you don't script every, if you, if you're not, if, if your talk is not, I could talk like that, not scripted. You're maybe potentially even just being lazy uh, because yeah. because it's, it, if you script it, it's like super, super prepared. And I've done non-scripted talks and I've done <coughs> scripted talks and my scripted talks have always come out much better, which mm-hmm. is what I was saying to him. What he said to me is he said that he um, doesn't script them, but he has like almost like scripted stories in his yeah, head. Yeah. So he would like tell those stories because he knows people like stories. So I was like, okay, fair, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And the, there's a big importance of stories in speeches. Mm. And so I started my TED talk with a story um, and then I added some smaller stories in between, yeah. like um, some career stories, stories about parenthood and I kind of brought it all back to this one topic of showmanship. Amazing. I can't wait to see it. I haven't seen it yet. So I can't, I can't wait to see it because it was like an out-of-body experience. I don't know how it went. I can imagine. People man. were telling me that it went really well, but... <laughs> you, it, must, you must have known like at the end, like... Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know that I did... Um, I, I I did the script. Yeah, I yeah. didn't mess up the script. Right. I didn't have any frozen fr- frozen moments. Mm. I didn't um or ah. Uh, that um, that right there is a massive achievement because yeah. even I I'm not in like an Instagram story video. Like, um, it's like well, look, I hate on that. the podcast. I'm constantly umming on the podcast. But that, a podcast is a bit more forgiving, isn't it? Because we we're just talking for a while. Maybe it's a bit more. Forgiving. So, it's not scripted at all, obviously. Yeah. So 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 in that sense, I I know that it went as well as I think it could have gone. Um, given the nerves and, and stuff. And, and also given the fact that, like, bro, you, you prep for this six months in advance. There's a lot of pressure on it. Mm. Um, but then within those six months, you're also constantly changing your talk. I changed my entire topic. Um, I was initially going to do it about marketing. So so the thinking behind that was basically, if I do it about... This actually, like... Well, this actually brings up a whole other topic, which is like, what should you do your TED talk about? Mm. Which is, I do, is something I want to go into. Yeah. But before we go into that, um, I changed my whole talk, but I also then, as in my topic, then I also, 48 hours before, actually changed, a, like added and removed loads of bits. Oh, really? I, I significantly changed it. This is the night before rehearsals. Oh, really? And at rehearsals, they say that you have to know your script. Um, so that's quite an interesting story. So mm. I was at Oman, so the re- rehearsals were on Thursday, all day Thursday, yeah. and I was at Oman's house Wednesday night. And so um, we were, he was asking about a talk, we were just catching up. It was the first time I've seen him when I, uh, bef- uh, since Dubai uh, uh, this time around. And we were catching up, and then he was like, bro, um, like, tell me about your talk. And I was like, he was, he was like, just give me like a little feeling. I don't want to know all of it, but because like, he was going to come, and, and he did. Um, so then I, I was giving, I gave him an excerpt. Basically, is that how you pronounce it? I think so, yeah. Uh, and he liked that. And then I was like, then we were talking about it, and he was like, um, "How do you have bits that do this? Do you have bits that?" And I said, "Yeah." And I was like, "Do you want to just hear the whole talk?" And he was like, "It's up to you." And then I said, "Do you know what? It might be beneficial." Yeah. So I ended up doing the whole talk with him, and bro, it was the best thing I did because it was this like se- you know, like you see um, like sessions behind the scenes. Obviously, this is a haram version of it, but like. You almost see that music producer behind the scenes music producers with like the artists and they just go like they're just in a zone where they're trying to figure out like the right 
mm. key or element and stuff like that. And of course, we don't promote music and we don't believe it's permissible and stuff. But I'm just talking about from an art perspective, like that angle of like really dissecting something. Um, it was almost like that. It was like I recited it to him. And then him and I were just up, we were dissecting. Can we move this here? Can we, can we remove this entirely? Is this needed, this bit? Can you add this in? It's the best thing we did, bro, because it, it really improved the talk. Yeah. But what it did do is it meant that 24 hours, like not even 24 hours, bro, like hours before I meant to have this talk perfected at rehearsals, um, we basically changed a bunch of it. So I get to rehearsals, I um, and someone had already started doing their talk, like prepping it, uh, um, giving their talk in, in rehearsals and stuff. And then the organizers were like, Faisal, we haven't, because because uh, I've been in Dubai and a lot of them are in London. It was in London. I wasn't there for a lot of the um, meetings, rehearsals. I couldn't make a lot of the virtual meetings because they were at, like nighttime London time, which was like mm. one a.m. or midnight for mm. us here. So they were like, "First, we haven't heard your talk since like November, October," uh, which was a significantly different talk to the one that, that I now have. Um, so they're like, "Do you mind just jumping on stage and performing it?" So for here I am, knowing that the night before I've actually changed it. And they want me to perform my talk on the actual TEDx stage in front of all of the other speakers. Mm. But I want to add another layer of uh, I want to add another layer of pressure here by telling you that they emailed me about four weeks before the show, saying um, we've decided that you're going to be our showstopper. You're going to be the final um, oh, act. Wow. Um, we think you're, like, you've got it in you to do that, and so obviously I was ex extremely excited about that. But that added another layer of pressure, and so the people in the room at rehearsals knew that I was like the main event mm. and I didn't, I knew in my head, I didn't have my talk down. And this is, this is 48 hours before we were performing it. Like we did it on Thursday rehearsals on Saturday, we we're doing the actual talk. So, um, I get on stage. And I was like, all right, I'll get my best shot. And they, they got a vibe for it. They liked it. And they were like, you know, it's about showmanship. We feel like you could be a bit more of a showman. But I was like, yeah, I'll just need to try and remember my lines. And then, um, then we had to do a second version. Like we had to do it again a second time, like a few hours later. Mm. And that time they were like, you smashed it. Like yeah. so much better than the first time. Yeah. And so um, there's two things I want to uh, mention about the talk. I'm now I'm like blabbering on about it. No, it's amazing to hear because it's so insightful for me. Well, I, I, wasn't I was actually going to dissect it on a separate video, but I, I, I'll do it here. So I, th I think you should definitely do that, by the way. Like I, I, a series on this, like what should TED, TED will be about? Like content directed to TED talkers. Yeah, I, I do. I'm going to drop milking it too much, but I do nah. agree. Yeah. Nah. But I will. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Milk it wherever it's gone. Bring the cows. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, so um, topic wise, uh, there's two things I want to talk about. Just in case I forget, um, <coughs> I'm going to tell you the two things before I go into it. So, there's topic, mm. and then there is um, how to, like, using props, right? All right. And presentation and stuff like that. So, topic wise, I was looking at how, what should I, how can I make the most out of this TED talk? Yes, they have 40 million subscribers on the TEDx channel, but also, and bear in mind, but sorry, this is a TEDx talk and not TED talk. The difference is TEDx is independently organized. Um, TED is organized by TED. So I was on the TEDx channel, which has 40 million subscribers. And you'll notice that, yes, some videos have 35 million views, but some have 400 views, 200 views. And in fact, the majority have like less than a thousand views. Mm. And so the point there is, is, just because you're doing a TED talk, TEDx talk, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go viral. You're going to have like this huge wave of like a uh, new business, a new network, people wanting to work with you. But what it is, is, is a, excuse the pun, it's a stage. It's a, it's, it's, it, it, it's a crack in the door. And you have to figure out how you can kick that door down. And I think the people, the majority fail. Not because I'm a better speaker than anybody else. And a mind might fail because it's not out yet on YouTube. It might be 400 views, bro. But I'm content knowing that I gave it my best shot. Yeah. And here's what I mean by that. If you look at the ones that go massive, bro, what they're doing is they're giving value to the audience, but they know that as 40 million people could watch this, I need to create some kind of value that's a through line for the majority of people in the world. Not something that's just for a niche. So how can I take my niche value or my story and apply it in a way where it adds value to as many people as possible. So um, somebody might be a, a person who like, you know, studied a language really well. They can either sit there and tell their story or they can say how to learn any language in 30 days. 
now they can tell us a story, but they can add value to most people. Yeah. And they're the ones that are successful. And so I didn't want to just tell my story because my story might be interesting to me. It might even be interesting to the 100 people in the room. It might even be interesting to the 100,000 people who are watching this, uh, who, who subscribe to Freshly Grounded. But it's not going to be interesting to 40 million people, bro. And so if, if there's a door of 40 million people, how can I make the most value out of it? And that's when I realized I don't want to tell my story. I want to add elements of my life through stories, but I want to have one pure ang like benefit that um, can add value to anybody's life. And so that's what I had decided. And then there was a further, uh, uh, upon having a discussion with you, and you actually helped me come to that conclusion as well, which was like, you know, um, what should the topic be? And initially they were interested in me doing about podcasting. I said, I don't want to do about podcasting uh, because podcasting is great. And it's, I've got so much uh, to be grateful for through the medium of podcasting. But that's what podcasting is for me. It's a vehicle, a medium. Um, but I've always said that if we have to change what we do, we would. Um, because the most important thing is the audience and the value. So anyway, um, I didn't want to do podcasting. Mean, you and I had decided we should do it, I should do it about marketing. And the reason for that is because essentially when you can say you've done a TEDx talk and I'm currently in the digital marketing space, essentially you become a TEDx speaker on digital marketing, which means it just essentially like makes your price go up yeah. you can get uh it, it, it gives you that like thing in your back pocket where it's like it's like a leaning back leaning on a degree yeah. almost it's like mm -hmm. you've got a degree in <coughs> business yeah. it adds something for like if you ever it's a level of security yeah um and so i was like that makes sense why not leverage this so it's like another tick on my cv in that sense so we started writing talk on that oh i didn't even know if i started writing talking that but then i was inspired to do a talk about the not the, basically the reason i changed the talk and made it about showmanship and, 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 and a deeper part of that is the idea of showmanship in this talk was turning, how to turn everyday moments into extraordinary experiences. That's what the whole tagline was. And the idea is, is that I just thought to myself, what, what, I, I saw one of the, the questions that they give you on TEDx, which is um, on how to structure your talk. One of the questions was something like, what's a problem that you think exists in the world that you think that you have a potential solution for? It was, that question was something like that. And I, that's what I started deep in. I thought, what's one thing that I would love, what's one message, generic message, because you're not allowed to speak about religion and politics and stuff. What's, what's one generic message that I would really love to have a microphone to tell people, like, this could improve your life? And I thought, it's that thing that we were speaking about, about just having a bit of finesse, having a bit of a, putting a bit of effort into something, um, trying to, um, try to ch achieve excellence. And I and I and I, I I put that into a word the word showmanship because I thought I showmanship and I want to talk about how anyone whether you're introvert or an extrovert can have showmanship because showmanship obviously often we relate it to someone being on stage or being an extroverted but I said that it's just about turning an everyday moment into an extraordinary experience and so a lot of it is taught to us by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when somebody's talking to you you look at them that's showmanship you're giving them attention you're you there's two ways you can do that you can listen to them and just. Um, passively, or you can really give them the attention. By giving them attention, you're doing it like a showman. You're, you're turning that ordinary moment into an extraordinary experience for that person. So that's what the talk is about. And uh, that's what I felt passionate about, and so that's why I ended up giving the talk about. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing was the props thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I so, so, so then I had this dilemma, which I was like, initially I was like, can I, I wanna do a, I wanna have a PowerPoint. First, I'm so glad I didn't end up doing a PowerPoint, but because people had issues with the clicker. Uh. Yeah. But I wanted to do a PowerPoint and I chose last minute not to. And the reason I chose not to is because I thought I want to challenge myself. A true great public speaker um, can make an impact with just their voice. Mm. And I've never known if I can do that. And as many public speaking engagements that I've done, I have used slides or I've had like fancy theatrics. Imagine telling, doing, imagine doing a TED talk on showmanship, the most theatrical concept, mm. and getting that message across with just your voice in the most minimalist way. Yeah. So I wanted to challenge myself to do that, and that's what I did. Um, however, there's one prop that I did have, and that was a, I called it an easel, but it's not an easel, but it was like a board with, a, you know, the massive papers and you could write. Yeah. That was a purely strategic move. Right. The reason for that move is because I, I knew no one else was doing that. Yep. On the night. Nice. And I thought, how can I make myself um, stand out for the audience, and how can I make them intrigued? Why has he got that there? What's he going to write on it? And I, I, there was a concept, the framework that I explained. And I just wrote the framework down there. But the idea was, it wasn't. I know that kind of goes against me saying, "Oh, I'm just using my voice." But the whole talk was my voice, 
there was a bit where I wrote down the framework, and the idea was strategically, um, so from a psychological perspective, um, it uh, ignites curiosity, mm. and that's what I wanted to do because um, I thought it added extra layer of depth. Um, so yeah, I think on top of what you just said, right? You physically writing down your thoughts in front of everybody as a much much deeper layer of depth rather than just always oh, got easier rather than the slideshow. It's like, no, 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 he's actually gonna write it right for you right now. It's yeah. not like a pre-prepared thing where he's just gonna click it. You're like on stage going through your thought process on this thing, on this framework and writing it as you go. That is, again, it, does, it doesn't take away from that fact that it's just you. Do you know what I mean? Because if anything, the slideshow is like, we've given talks together where there's a slideshow behind us and we're clicking mm. it and you kind of you lean on it as a bit of a crutch just like you know hey don't look at me for a second look at this for a second and it sort of takes the pressure off in a way but the easel if anything that does the opposite i think or whatever it's called because you've got like get a marker out is a marker working properly are you a good are you good with a marker i'm not good with a marker am i draw, am i writing this big enough is it going to fall over when i tap it lots of things can go wrong there and the fact that you're just doing it physically in front of them that's um commendable man because a lot of people were just say, i should do the slideshow so i'm back I'm, I'm now looking forward to seeing this even more as am i bro because i'm not seeing it i, I might yeah. have i might be thinking it went well when it was appalling so yeah i don't know <laughs> he really did fall over he didn't yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah <laughs> no it's fine inshallah it'll be fine um but interestingly to go completely off, off of like your amazing um uh, advice just there firstly you've definitely solidified my th feeling that you should um do a series on this just for ted talkers and it might get like 75 views but like it's 75 TED Talkers, isn't it? Um, because you've got a whole, you've gone through it. But it reminded me, and I gave the example of burping earlier for some reason. I, subconsciously, I must have remembered. But while you were talking, I did remember at our Asia presentation last year. As I was talking, I did actually burp by accident. I didn't notice. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> one person noticed, right? They were in the front row. And as soon as I did it, um, they like stopped themselves from laughing. And I just had to like breeze past it. I just like literally continued my ah, sentence. That's good that you did. But that, yeah, I, 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 I just remember that it happened when, when, when you were talking. But was it like a, it was, was it like a, uh, uh, it was a bit in between. Cause oh it like, no. it came up, yeah, it came out like, as um, you're speaking. Yeah, as I was speaking. No, I've never heard, <laughs> I've never heard about that before. Yeah, <laughs> never right. burp story. I don't think I've ever done it in, like, I think that day we were eating super quick to get on the stage. Something like that, yeah, right? Yeah, it was yeah. a bit mad, but uh, that was funny. But yeah, uh, I'm oh looking forward no. to seeing it, man. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah, as am I. Um, yeah, and I hope that I did some value. I'm I enjoyed sure the whole process. And I'm looking forward to like, you know, the next the next thing, I guess, because that was, it was fun to prepare for it and stuff. And it was something that TEDx is a non-profit, so you don't get paid. Um, the organizers are not getting paid. And, um, you know, you cover your own costs oh. of your own <laughs> flights. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so um, what was the point of me saying that? Uh, that, so the point was that I was doing it on the side, almost like it was a nice thing to have yeah. like that excited me, I suppose. But now I'm looking to do more speaking engagements. Uh, but it, and I've, 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 I've proven to myself that I can uh, give speaking, uh, do speaking engagements that are not specific to uh, only the Muslim audience. And so I am looking for, and, and this was around human behavior. Obviously, I have a background, academic background in criminology and then interviewed like hundreds of of some of the world's greatest minds and so i i was able to like really draw from that and so i'm looking forward to doing some more cbk engagements um paid yeah yeah so paid speaking yeah. engagements for those listening yeah <laughs> dubai, business class flies yeah <laughs> dubai is a good place for this as well man there's yeah. lots of these events small ones like very niche ones and like just general business ones, yeah. you should just reach out to them. Um, you say, look, I just did a TEDx and like looking to do this stuff. And it may be a case of, again, like um, the first two or three are not paid, but then like you get a big break and like someone calls you up and we need somebody. I, 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 mean? I think like I, I've done so many speaking engagements now that I'm at some point you have to, um, not in arrogant way, but you have some, at some point be like, look, this is um, uh, something that I feel I'm giving value yeah. to a company or to an audience yeah. or something, and so um, yeah, I, I want to have that as another revenue. You got a TEDx talk there, man. You should, you should definitely actually. Pay, that was uh, the thing that, th 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 that gave me a bit of confidence, but also the fact that I at the same month turned thirty because I've always had a bit of an inferior, inferiority 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 complex mm. where I'm like ah, oh, like I have like sometimes I want to do when I do my courses or when I teach or do consulting I just think oh I'm in my 20s man like people would just be like oh he's a kid in his 20s yeah. but I've had 
I've I've had meetings with forty year olds, fifty year olds that I'm like like um, advising them on, but I would never pub- I've never publicly done that as much. Uh, because of that inferiority complex. And then now I feel like turning 30 was the point where I was like, look, I'm turning 30. I've done a TEDx talk. Hopefully like now I can have confidence in myself. Yeah. And um, yeah, like make this a yeah project almost. I used to have that like imposter syndrome. When That's I was, the like, imposter syndrome. Yeah, it was like... Interesting I, that you kept that from me that whole time. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to keep that back for myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I know what he's talking about. <laughs> um... What broke that for me was like, I told yeah, you this you before. You don't seem to have that, bro. I used to have it. And yeah. I don't, th- I, I, I have it in some context now. But um, when it comes to like marketing and that kind of thing, I don't because again, like right. maybe a few years ago, alhamdulillah, um, I, I was on calls with like CMOs of big companies, yeah. this and that. And it wasn't that I knew more than them. It was just that in a specific topic, I knew more than them. Exactly. That's, so, exactly that's what right. it yeah. is. Yeah. It wasn't arrogant. Oh, this guy's seen I know more. No, no. Just in S- how SEO has changed in last year, I know a bit more than this guy. So I can just tell him, oh, now Google wants this, this, this. Doesn't mean I'm more knowledgeable than him or I should earn uh, much money, whatever. But there is certain topics that I know more about than someone who is more qualified and like 20 years older than me. And it's, that's not an arrogant thing to say. You know what I mean? You can I remember you telling me that when you realized that when CEOs were asking you for advice on how to do certain things, yeah. you're like, hold on a second, you're one in the company asking yeah. me. And it gave you that level of confidence. It, right? it, it does because um, they're not asking you how should I run my company? Because obviously I'm not the right person to ask. But, if you, but there's specific niche topics where, yeah, I do know a thing or two about that. And it's not because I've studied for centuries or anything like that. It's just because I've been doing that work for the last eight, nine months or two, three years. So I just know a thing or two. Mm. Whereas somebody else who doesn't, They've never done, um, you know, an Instagram post. I've never done an SEO campaign or anything like that. Of course, he doesn't. He he's a CEO or he's a CMO, but his his attention has been elsewhere the last couple of years. Yeah. So he needs a primer on that, and so he's coming to me for that. So I shouldn't feel an imposter syndrome in that context. Yeah. Right. You're right. And and it's important not to let that sort of um, turn to arrogance. Turn to arrogance. Yeah. Oh, I know. I'm the but best. But sometimes marketer, you but. fear arrogance to the point where you then have no confidence. Yeah, that's... Like, even me speaking now, just the first half of this podcast about the TED Talk stuff, like, I am conscious of some of what I'm saying coming across as arrogant. But I am, I'm, 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 I am I'm, no longer um, listen to that side of... This, this is a perfect example. Like, I have not done a TED Talk. You have. I'm asking you, like, how was it? Advice? Like, it doesn't mean you're being arrogant by selling me that. You're just... Yeah. You've got experience, something that I've got zero experience in. So it's a perfect exchange of information. There's no arrogance child involved. So I, I might have done... Um, I might have done that talk, and I did. Um, <laughs> might have smashed but it. But you did an event even greater than uh, than mine, and uh, uh, noticeable by the extremely shorter length of your hair, long uh, which is uh, normally normally a lot longer. Um, yeah. You did Umrah. How I was did. Umrah, bro? Alhamdulillah. So in the time you, were, you did you go the same time I was in London? You did, didn't you? Or maybe just no, you, no, no. I think you came back. Oh, okay. I went like first week. Oh of yeah, you're Fe- right. Because I saw you. Yeah, first week of February, I think. There How was, was it, bro? Hamza, amazing, yeah. amazing. Went with the kids, um, and there was um, it was uh, first and foremost, it was amazing. Hamza, the blessing uh, to be there, right? But there was one thing that, like, one story I wanted to share with you specifically because you were telling me about. Uh, between Medina and Mecca, how to get there, especially with kids. Like, I was going to ask you about that. Your experience. Do, there, yeah, yeah. she do training. She do um, tax. I thought I'd update you with that because we had a little back and forth about right. So, book the train. We're on a train, all right? Get to the train station. Do you want to give the context or is it not relevant of that, you know, what what our conversation was before? Is that not relevant for this? Uh, Okay, I'll give the context. So you were telling me that the easiest thing would be to use a taxi, right? Go from Medina to Mecca in a taxi. After I had got the train. And you'd got the train. So I I was taking your advice on board for sure. Um, But it's a four hour drive. Yeah. And and the context from my situation was, I was gonna have two kids with me, Yeah. right? So one four year old, one seven month old, I'm not so that was on my mind. And a four hour trip of a seven month old, I wasn't really on it. So booked, booked the train, got to the train station in Medina. Um, everything's booked, got about half an hour, 20 minutes before supposed to leave. Now bear in mind, because we were a seven month old, we've got a whole bunch of stuff with us that you wouldn't normally take, right? My wife bought like a little steamer to steam her food, things like random stuff, right? Little baby food, packets, whatever. Um, so random that, stuff, but not around him when yeah. you're seven months old. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If you didn't have a seven month old, you'd be very concerning. Yeah. But for us, we needed that stuff, yeah. right? <laughs> Some of the stuff we didn't need, by the way. But it was there. We had, but basically, it's resulted in two massive suitcases. Okay. Right. Two massive suitcases and um, a smaller one. Okay. So three in total, but two of them are very big. Now, 
I did not do the research properly when I booked the tickets that your suitcase had to be a certain, couldn't be above a certain amount, right, to take on a train, okay? In weight or in size? In size, size like literal okay. size, like okay. uh, centimeters. Got there about 25 minutes ago for a train wave. I got to the turnstiles. The woman looks at it and says, like, you can't take that on the train, right? And I was like, oh, well, I need it, whatever. She goes, go back to that guy over at that desk, talk to him, went there. I was like, look, I've got seven month old, you know, I can't do a four hour drive. Like, what can we do here? He's like, look, no way. You're not getting on with those. It doesn't fit, he said to me. You can't do it, right? So I'm panicking now. There's like 10 minutes left now for the train to leave. Um, what happens is the brother who was pushing our stuff, you can pay those guys, right, to, to push, to get a trolley, right? To push your stuff on a trolley. He sort of motioned, he was, English wasn't great, but he motioned to me that he could go up first and take the stuff up. And then I can go talk to the guy and just try and sweet talk him. But at least he's already up there to save me because the 10 minutes of the train is leaving and I'm still at the turnstiles downstairs. So he's gone up there. I've gone round and alhamdulillah, this, the, the guy who was at the turnstiles now, they changed. Um, he was like, he listened to my sort of sob story. I said, look, I've got a seven month old, four year old, which is trying to get there. He let us on. And I think the fact that the, the cases weren't in his view <laughs> was good, you know, because like he couldn't see how big they were. The, the other guy, the brother who's doing Troy, he's already taken upstairs. So I'm we've got up there. Uh, bear in mind, I'm traveling with my wife's cousin as well. So he's got his own cases and stuff. They've all gone up there. My guy who's pushing the trolley, it's, just, it's a nice story because I don't mind it because he, he does a massive favor. He asked me for a tip. Before, before getting on, on, he asked my cousin for it, um, my wife's cousin for a tip, got a big tip and asked me for a tip, but separately. So he got like two tips from us. Uh, but I haven't done, we got on the train. Um, that's kind of the, the, the end of the story. But my point being, I still would take the train. Even, though, the even though they had that massive, and I was, when I got on a train, bro, I was like flustered. We got there like one minute. He got stuff on the train. How much tip did you give? I gave, what did I give him? So you got to pay 25 for the, for the thing, okay. right? I gave him another 25 as a tip. But okay, I'd already got, 100%. Yeah, he'd already got another, I don't know what my cousin, I think he also gave 25 or 30, something like that. So wow. he got like a triple for that. But I still, even though I didn't know, he got the double tip. I still said, you know what? He deserved yeah, it because yeah. if he didn't take the upset, I don't think we would have done it and we would have had to be forced to take the train, the uh, yeah. taxi. But even so, I'd still take the train. Why? So that's my answer. Because a car... Bro, well, I, I think your answer of taking the train mm. is the majority opinion as well. Is it? Yeah. yeah. So I think like, you're, on, you're in the right I'm on the right train here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> The train journey itself was not that easy, especially on the way back. Like, really? You know, yeah, my daughter was like... Did you book business? I didn't. What? I didn't book business, yeah. It was... I, I, I looked at the videos and stuff, and it was like, I'm not sure what am I paying for. It's a bit of an extra, like, padded seat. Really. But wasn't it like... Um, I, I can't there was some, remember. You get, you get a TV, you have it. And yeah, it's just like, I thought it was just more space. It. I think the reason I booked business is it was like, I think like 20 pound more or something. I can't no, remember. That's no? what I thought. No, it's much more. Oh. Like, yeah, like... It's like 50% more or something oh, like that. Oh, okay, Significantly fine, more. fine, yeah. Because I was going to do it because I, I thought, I remember you saying that, but it's actually quite more. But yeah, um, even st even with that, because I remember getting on a train thinking like, I was thinking about, should I have got a taxi? But after that train journey, which is like two and a half hours, I was like, yeah, I have got the train. Because my daughter wasn't that happy about a train, my seven month old, I had to change it multiple times and that. Doing that in a car, it would have ruined me. Oh, because you had to change, yeah, of course. Yeah, fine, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So yeah, the train, look, the, Train journey is more comfortable, I'd say, obviously, yeah. especially if you, like you said, you have a baby, you have to change her and stuff like that. And then um, it's shorter. Is that AC yeah. and stuff like that? And you can just change them. If, if I'm in a car, bro, my daughter doesn't last that long, like 45 minutes. And she's like getting cranky. She's gone to the mm. toilet. Need to change her. It's like, bro, I can't, if I stop every 45 minutes. And there's a toilet on the train. Yeah, there's a toilet on the train. Yeah, it's true. So it's like, bro, it'll take me like a day to get down there. So my the experience was basically, the reason I told you to get, get a car is because I was excited about the train because everyone was like, oh, there's this new train within to my car. It's yeah. really quick. And it, it was just because I calculated the, this is going to be one of those things that ends up getting clipped like the tax thing again. It's <laughs> yeah. like, that's not how it works. Yeah. You get into this bracket, yeah, where You get into this tax bracket. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And actually it was like one hour drive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, I can't, I'm, I, now, but look, guys, be forgiving of me because I did this trip eight, nine months ago now. Mm. But from what I remember, the, the yes, the train journey was shorter, but first of all, we had to get a taxi from the hotel to the train. Then we yeah. had to get a taxi in Mecca, in, uh, was it Jeddah we landed in? Where did you land in? Did you land in yeah, Mecca? I went in Medina. In, no, but when you go from Mecca, did you go from, there's a train station in Mecca? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then you go from there to the hotel as well. So it's like, um, 
taxi, train, taxi. Um, and um, you're waiting for, we had to wait a while yeah. for the train and things like this. So we were in the waiting room. So when I was calculating everything, I was thinking to myself, there's not a huge difference in the timing from like door to door timing, right? And uh, yeah. now that's what was probably going to get clipped because probably someone's like, it's yeah. like four hours oh, different. Look at it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then the second thing is, is that we had like all these suitcases and stuff. And I just thought to myself, I remember because uh, putting all the suitcases in the taxi, then taking them from the taxi to the train station, taking them upstairs, putting them in the waiting room, coming back out, like going down. And it's just all this like putting them on the train. And then we have to do the same thing on the other end, get the ta- get the uh, call a cab, get them in the suitcase. And I thought door to door, you put the suitcases in a taxi and you take them out of the same taxi and you're there at the hotel, yeah, right? I, uh, yeah. And so I just thought from an ease perspective, and then I, ca- when I, at the time when I calculated the time, there wasn't a huge difference in time from door to door. Mm. I was just thinking, and the price, by the way, there wasn't a big difference in the price. There isn't there. And so I just thought, you know what? Put my suitcases in one car, sit in the car. Yes, you have to stop, um, but then to get in a head arm and stuff. And you get in the car and then you just get off on the other end and it's just super simple. So I guess it depends on what you're trying to optimize for. That's the thing, right? Yeah. And guys, you've got to flip, I'm going to flip your perspective here because for me, those those stops were like needed. I was craving those. Yeah, that, yeah, as yeah. In, sorry, th- those stops that you were like trying to cut out, which is like, you get to a station and from the station, yeah, went, I needed that. Up, yeah, I needed, I needed the, the breakups because I needed the toilets for the kids, for myself, just like in general, grab a coffee. I like that. I like to just like, I actually like to break my journey up sometimes. It, it helps so so i I, yeah. I i wrote down notes this was in August. i wrote down notes because i because of what i'm doing now i'm recollect i'm recollecting probably a bit wrong and okay. so i know that about myself and so i wrote down notes for my next almost trip mm. now these are notes are going to sound really bougie so i do apologize and always like oh, this guy's that. but these are the notes i wrote down so that i don't so i can rely on my data and not on my mm. like what i remember so i wrote book direct to Jeddah and do makkah first agreed yeah book direct to Jeddah. Yeah. yeah. What did I do then? I, 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 you probably went to Medina like me. Yeah, and I stopped off in Jeddah, I think. So, or something. Okay. Well, for our train just went through Jeddah, but that stopped for like no, five no, minutes. No, no, flight. Oh, so no, we probably did then. You went to Mecca, then you flew back from Jeddah. Something like Yeah. Yeah. I think something like that. Most people do that. Maybe. I can't remember. But it says book direct Jeddah. I think the reason also was that um, Mecca was very um, busy. And it was nice. It's kind of like, I was thinking it'd be nice to go to Medina after this and just like having done the Umrah, enjoy the Prophet City, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Masjid. But you had a different experience, didn't you? You preferred Mecca, right? I mean, yeah. Which makes it the holy city in the world. Yeah, I, is, yeah. is Mecca the holy city? I know it has... Yeah, uh, yeah, obviously... The Haram is... The Haram is, there. Is, um, but then more they say the best city in the world is Medina. Alon is best, but there's yeah, more. Alana's there's best. more reward. There's more, more reward in praying. Of in, course, yeah, in, of course, in Makkah, fine. So. Yeah, yeah. But you preferred Makkah, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Even though it was, it was busy. I mean, Medina isn't exactly quiet. It's still quite kind of busy. So I didn't really feel like there was a massive difference in the, right. um, in like busyness. Mm. And Makkah was just like, did you feel a sense of calm in Medina? I did. Like an extra sense of calm. I, I did, but I also felt in, in Makkah, man. Yeah. I felt it. I didn't. I didn't. Although, yes, there was a lot more people around. Um, you get a lot more like. Um, um, how can I put it? There's a lot more. It's just a lot more going on. A lot more going on. Yeah, right. A lot more going but on for your for your, for all of your senses. Like you're quite st- um, stimulated. Cor- yeah, true. So, and I felt that. Yeah. But I still the 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 vibe of Mecca that you get is just like it, it overpowered that. Mm, for, that's that. Well, that's yeah. I I I can't fault, yeah. I can't fault that. Um, the other note I wrote was book a hotel in Clock Tower. So the reason no, I, wrote I that, totally disagree with that. Oh, is it? No, I do disagree with that now yeah. as well. Yeah, I yeah. do. After you, what you said. Yeah, yeah. basically the lift get foot too full. Yeah, I, I, I was again. My we travelled with my wife's cousin. He was in the clock tower. We were not. Um, and it was just uh, the one day I just couldn't meet him. We said, "Oh, let's meet here." Just couldn't busy, get, yeah. could not get to him. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, so my count, my alternative. There's um hotels on um Jebel Umar. There's like there's like um Hilton. Um, I think there's two Hiltons there. And the uh, Conrad, I think they're all Hilton, aren't they? Um, they're really good, and they're not in the main tower, so you never get issues like getting in and out of them. But it's like a an extra two minute walk. Fine, I agree with you. I think what I meant, essentially, the point I was getting at here was to book something that's like where you're saying like close. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is, is because 
in the grand scheme of things, it does make thing it does make a bit of a difference. Now I'm very, I am very, I am conscious of the fact that this is obviously like a luxury trip that I'm talking about, like book it like right close to it, and not everyone has that opportunity. Yeah. And I've done numerous bro where we've like had to we're like 20 minutes out in my car and we like have to get a bus or like a 20 minute walk or 30 minute walk or 40 minute walk. We're like up the hill and we've got a bus, like a 10 minute bus ride into my car. So I, I have also done that version, but um, yeah, this time around I was like, if you can, anything you can do to make that trip yeah. easier and spend more time in the Haram. Yes. Um, if you have the opportunity or ability to do that, um, then do that. I wrote, don't take train to Medina, take private car, should cost 550 reals estimated. I wrote that because I don't want to get mugged off. Yeah. So I was like, right, let me write down how much <coughs> I got quoted. Yeah. And and how much was the train? I think it was, oh, what was it now, man? I th- I don't want to get it wrong. I, th- I think it was 257 reals. In total? Per person. Really? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't mad cheap. Let me double check that. Um, I'll check that now. I'm pretty sure. And, and I think, um, oh, was that, sorry, that, that may have been business class, you know. Let me try and check this now. I don't mean, oh, here we go. Found it. Tickets out quick. Why well, was it to say the price though? Mm. Okay. So, yeah, two hundred fifty-nine per person, right? No, that's not tr- that's not correct. Sorry, one second. That's like a total of something. One seven two eight divided by. What's the name of the train service? Haramein something, just Haramein train, I think. Yeah, I can't find the actual price per person. I think it was about 247, something like that per person, which is about 50 pound per person one way. Oh, one, no, really? Yeah. Let me, one way, uh, let me see how much we pay. Pretty sure. Haramein. I'll just do a new book in and check it right now. Yeah, I can't I can't see either. Okay. It's interesting that I can't find it. I'm just gonna search right now. I wanna get it now from the website. This is live. Come mm-hmm. to you live from the Hermine website. If it loads. Why can't I find it? Did I not book it under this email address? Mm. I found my total, but am I good enough at maths to divide it, including kids' tickets? No, I'm not. What was the total? 172, uh, 1728. Um, if I want that one. Boy. Yeah, it wasn't cheap. Yeah. And that was, that's what I'm saying, that was uh, economy. That was economy, yeah. But again, I'd still choose the train. I can't find... Um, right, this last page. I found... Uh, uh, okay, look at this. Mm-hmm. Um... I paid one one nine six, um, but I imagine that's return. Or you don't think so? Oh no, nah. of course it's not. We didn't go back. Yeah, it's not return. Yeah, I paid one one nine six. That was two of us. Did you book it very in much business? in advance? I think so. Yeah, I, I, I tried to do a thing. Yeah, that's probably where I went wrong. I probably booked it way. One one nine six. No way, bro. That's not cheap, is it? Um, mine was more expensive. I'm sure it was. I paid one one nine six, which is two hundred fifty pounds for the train. No, how many? I people? didn't pay that, bro. I only paid two hundred fifty. There's no I think, you, I, think you, I think you got mugged into that, mate. Look, this is this is the thing that I missed, right? It usually pops up saying that your bag needs to be that size. Wow. I just X'd out of that. Actually. Yeah, it's fine. Maybe I did pay that much. But sometimes you just like, oh, oh here we go, here we go. It's, oh no, <clears throat> 172 uh, reals. Man, I'm sure sense. I paid more. Yeah, I don't think I paid one thousand. I, I think that must mean something else because I'm just looking at a bank statement that are, are like transaction. Mm. Um. <laughs> I'm says, your purchase for 1,196 reals at Al Haramain Speed Rail King. Yeah. <laughs> I think it. Anyway, uh, but 550. I think I. I don't think I paid that. I think I paid closer to um, 550 reals because I said I wrote should cost 550 reals. I remember thinking at the time, oh, this is similar price to how much you paid for the train anyway. So I think it was about. Maybe. I think I all in all probably paid about hundred pounds. Right, right now, if I'm going to book one way from uh, Medina to Mecca, it's 172, right? Reals. Reals. Yeah, okay, that so makes sense. About 35 pound. Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. So I, I think I paid a bit more because I was booking it quite close. Uh, but if you do it yeah. earlier, but point being, um, with kids, 
I would definitely recommend the train, man. Yeah, Even fair enough, bro. I think there's more advantages to the train, probably. But I'm, I, I just prefer the idea of sitting down somewhere and then ending up. You, I want to be carried you, to my destination. Yeah, I, you, you're, I was the kid who used to fall asleep and <laughs> ask my dad to carry me to my yeah. bed. Yeah, I, I, yeah, but for me, I would need to stop, stop too much. I need to stop like Fair three, yeah, four and times that time. Toilets on the train and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. it's just like pff, it's nice. I, li I like that, man. I, I, speaking of nervousness, right? I don't get nervous in a in a in a in a um, orthodox way, like a sweaty palms and like jittery. I I I, I get like stomach pain. So like you I mentioned that before. Yeah, that's how. Sometimes so sometimes I have something coming up that I should be nervous for, and so I was like, "Oh, you nervous?" I'm like, no, I'm not, but I do need to go to the toilet. So you that's, like, that's, body, uh, that's, that's pretty normal. Is it? Yeah, yeah, it's normal. Yeah. That's definitely normal. Okay. I was going to go to the doctor about that. No, 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 that's very normal. <laughs> Although, um, uh, it reminds me, it's not actually related, but there's a book called, uh, obviously, by Dale Carnegie called How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, which mm. I mentioned before. Yeah. And in that book, he does talk about how stress can lead to stomach ulcers. <laughs> Yeah, but that's not related to nerve. What you're talking about, yours is like just nerves. And nerves you say like that, but weak stomach. That, nervous, that's normal. Yeah, but nervous is, is a form of stress, isn't it? I guess so. But, and also, I think with stress, like a nerve, sorry, like when you're preparing for talk or something, the the thing you have to try and figure out that you, the thing you have to try and do is play a mental game with yourself and change the perception of what those nerves are and actually turn it into yeah. use that adrenaline and turn that nerves into excitement yes. and uh yeah excitement if you can do that mm. you're onto a winner yeah and I, I, a, a w as the kids say yeah. these days the youth them do be saying that yeah they do be doing yeah. that another another thing is like sometimes i can't remember who it was i feel like it's someone we know right um i think it is someone we know and we were talking about like starting a business right like some project that we want to start and they said to us i think it was us people dream, dream, dream this whole thing they were like oh do you not feel like nervous starting a business or like um you know just like apprehensive about like oh what if it fails it was like that right and it was like that was a big perception change for me where like someone else would see a project starting or launching as like a nervous time where it's like oh what if it fails what if it doesn't do well and so on and so forth but for me is i get excited by that because mm -hmm. it's like it's a new project i love a new project love starting things and launching it oh, is it gonna work and if it doesn't work i don't care it's like it's fine like i'll just launch another one try something else but is uh, this whole perception? I've been re uh, watching a lot of like, perception videos, especially when it comes to marketing, of like same, same um, thing, same event happening, but different perceptions or different way of presenting it can change the entire perception. And I guess what we're talking about is more like personality and and, ha and percepting an event. But I think I told you about this, um, Jason Sutherland. I think his name is Jason. Or his, his, his second name is definitely Sutherland. He used to be CMO of, of British Airways, right? Uh, maybe he still is. I don't think he is. Though. But he's become like a thought leader now. I think he's doing lots of talks and stuff like that. But he was saying, and I told you this, imagine on the M25, you're going to Heathrow, you hit traffic jam, you know, if it gets bad, you can miss your flight. Imagine they had a VIP lane on the M25 where you pay, you pay 25 pound on your app in the car, you just jump into it and zoom down M25 and you skip all the traffic. He was saying the public perception of that would be anyone who uses that to skip all the traffic they're, you know, like a, a ponce, they're like, they're, they're up themselves, snobby, um, and they would subconsciously or psychologically refrain from doing it because they don't want to be perceived as a snob. Right. Oh, oh, you use a VIP lane where the rest of us sit here in traffic, right? But he said, you can do the same thing, but instead of making it like a pay as you go type of thing or pay when you need it, if you make it a booking, right? So you have to book it the day before or a week in advance, whatever, if you book it, Suddenly, it's the same thing, same lane, but the perception would change so much that nobody would see it as a snobby thing uh, because like you haven't just sort of snapped decision. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll drop 25 pound on that and go. If you, if you make it a bookable thing, the perception is, you know- They deserve at, it. They deserve it. That's at interesting, isn't it? At worst, I'll blame myself for not thinking ahead. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Same thing, different perception with a very slight tweak or change. Yeah, bro. That's interesting, isn't it? Like even just generally, like, that, that example is a good example. Mm. Uh, and obviously, if he is in the position that he is, that you say he is, yeah. then obviously, uh, then obviously, that's probably based on research as well. Yeah. Um, but th th that perception discussion is interesting. And like you, for some reason, recently, I've been a little more intrigued by perception. Mm. And I'm just going to search my notes for the word perception because I think I feel like I feel like I wrote something down recently 
about perception. I can't wait to percept what you're going to say. <laughs> the, the only thing I can find is sometimes it's not about meeting your audience's expectations. It's about changing their perception. Mm. Uh, I don't know what that well, was that's about. It. I mean, this, this, that ties into your, your easel thing. Do you know what I mean? When you see the easel there, you're setting, you're setting the perspective, right? You're setting what, what, perspe what perspective do I want the audience to have of me before you even step out there. Do you know what I mean? That, the, again, that, the presentation, he said, you present that lane is it a snap decision, 25 pound? Yeah, drop 25 quid and go down. Or is the perception, no, it's bookable, open to everybody, you know, just as long as you think in advance or, or plan in advance, you can get it. Same thing, different pr presentation, which changes the perception. So, yeah. that, that's the perception is so important. Yeah. Bro, I've, I've written. <laughs> what, what have you wrote it down? <laughs> I've got this note from 2012, uh, because I searched perception. I've got this note from 2012. Okay. But I don't know if I want to say it because I don't know where this is from. And uh, I don't know where my head was at in 2012. <laughs> okay. I do know where my head was at in 2012. And I'll tell you this much. I wasn't a great person. But, oh gosh, how old was I in 2012? That's um, 12 years ago, mate. Was it? Yeah, it's a long time ago, man. Yeah, I was in my teens. Wow. Um, That's crazy, isn't it? Okay, I'll read the note. It's really weird. Okay. Oh. It says... I'm only in exile from the pastoral... I don't even know what pastoral means. What does pastoral yeah, mean? I'm not even sure myself. <laughs> I must have copy-pasted it from something else. Mm. He says, I'm only in exile from the pastoral idealized nothingness of a town on the border of the limitation of memory and perception. I am empty of all existence. What on earth does that mean? And why was I writing that in 2012? You're right. <laughs> That's definitely something copy-pasted because I don't even know what those words mean. Yeah, past... I know it. Everything except I'm pastoral. Gonna I'm going to ask ChatGPT now. I'm going to say... Just copy paste that in and say, explain what this means. Yeah, first of all, I'm going to say, I'm going to say to it, is this excerpt from anywhere? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, and if not, expl uh, can you try and explain what it means? Yeah, I'm just conscious of like... Yeah, where, I'm just trying to think where did that come from. The excerpt you provide doesn't appear to be direct quote from, a, from any widely recognized source. Uh, based on my current database. However, it's deeply evocative and philosophical statement that seems to blend existential and possibly sur surrealist themes. Here's an interpretation. It's given me an interpretation. Should we interpret it? Yeah, go on. <clears throat> um, it says, the first part, I'm only in exile from the pastoral idealized nothingness of a town on the border of the limitation of memory and perception. That is, that it, it said, this part of the statement suggests a feeling of displacement or alienation from a place that is both idyllic and non-existent. So mm -hmm. the pastoral idolizes idyllic and then non-exist, uh, and the non-existent or void is the nothingness. The town reference is metaphorically located at the very edge of what can be remembered and perceived, indicating space, indicating a space that is almost beyond human understanding or grasp. This could symbolize a longing for a simpler, more innocent existence that is, however, recognized as, in, as an illusion or unattainable. Then it says, I am empty of existence, all existence. This line takes the feeling of alienation a step further, expressing profound sense of emptiness or lack of being. It might reflect existential despair or the search for meaning in a seemingly indifferent universe. The overall concept, the overall, this o the overall excerpt conveys a sense of being lost or disconnected, not just from a physical place, but from the essence of being itself. It grapples with the limitations of human experience, memory, perception, existence, and the longing for something beyond those limits, even if that something is an idealized nothingness. I was okay. definitely lost in 2012. It sounds kind of like a... So pastoral means like um, like a shepherdy lifestyle, like a countryside lifestyle type thing, or countryside type, like environment pastoral environment so like you were trying to say like you're like on the edge of the edge of the edge of like society i don't know um but that is but it's uh, definitely copy and pasted from something yeah it sounds like it because that's not something i would write as it sounds, in like it sounds like a poem almost like a poem yeah i'm empty of all exist and I, it's now slowly coming back to me because i remember that line i'm empty of all existence but i don't know where that's from yeah interesting Alhamdulillah. It's Alhamdulillah. also interesting that I have notes from 2012 on my phone. I, I was just checking to see if I had anything like that. And um, not in my notes, but I've got Google Docs out of that old, but it all just work related. So there's nothing like, interesting mm. in that sense. 
Mm. Vad måste jag säga? Hmm. I found an old note of me comparing rental properties. Oh really? And now look at you. <laughs> yeah. Now look at you. I'm just. I'm not yeah. That's uh, interesting. Anyway, um, <clears throat> bro, I uh, had a. Um, I'm, I've got. I've set myself a task, like a self improvement mm. task, right? Okay. And it sounds like a weird one, but. Um, Basically, I've sent myself a task to try and reduce the amount of voice notes I send. Okay. And uh, and send texts instead. Interesting. The reason being is because um, has anyone have you ever like received a voice note and gone, oh, I'll listen to that later, and then you don't get around to it? Yeah, true. Because yeah. It's basically mm. like a coded message. You know, you like, oh, I have to get time to listen to this. True. And um, also listen to it listen to this person making sense of it in their voice in real time which takes time and it's like oh I'll get around to it whereas if it was a message you'd be able to instantly read it and and get the information and then if you needed to action inf- on that information you could if you if you then needed to ignore it and delete it to later because it wasn't that important then you could but at least you know the context with a voice note it's all like coded yeah. right yeah <laughs> and so <clears throat> sometimes some people like bro I've got voice notes on my phone now where people have sent me voice notes and then they've sent me another voice note that's like four or five seconds long and then another voice note yeah. I should actually listen to those but the <laughs> point is that that's probably a really important message and but if they just send a text because I mean, so, I'm driving yeah. I'm with the kids it's so crazy bro. I don't always so I'm, when, I see, when I see voice note 56 seconds I'm like alright that's a voice note I'll get around to that and then you just end up forgetting about mm. it but I do that a lot I send voice notes a lot and I think it's I'm not saying that everyone sends voice notes is selfish but I think it's quite a selfish thing to do because for me, for my perspective, because when I send a voice note to somebody, I send it because I'm like, this is easier for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think about the other person. But if I was receiving one, I'd prefer to just receive a summary on text so I can analyze yeah. it. And so I'm trying to be more selfless. And for me, that is actually weirdly mm. uh, sending less voice notes. And so one hack that I found is I'm just using voice dictation instead. <laughs> I use that sometimes. Yeah. It's not very accurate. It's not great. It, this, um... But then it's just putting a bit of effort to send text because I feel like nobody loves receiving voice notes. I actually, I actually prefer receiving voice notes. I'll tell you why. One, but you're hundred percent right. Is the con is I can't listen to that right now. I'll do it later. And I do sometimes things will f- fall through the cracks for me, right? And it gets ignored for too long. However, this kind of also reminds me of, of something else I said to you before, which is like we're in you and me and anyone else in our position. We've got like young kids and stuff. We're in a we're in a time in our lives where like our day to day is very like this this pick up kids get working. And, and so like, we don't have that much sort of free time between each task. And so a voice note isn't ideal for us. But I feel, I feel like there's other people who I know who are like, they're single or they're newly married. And they do have some time. And that used to be me, of course. And that person, voice notes are much better than text. Cause it's like, oh, I could just play that as I write this email. I could play that as I do this. Mm. Whereas you and me right now, we don't have that luxury to just like play that. Kids are in the car or whatever, whatever. So I feel like different people, different times in their lives, it might be different. And maybe you're just going into that part of your life which is like, it's now like the cons outweighing the pros. You know what I think a voice note is beneficial? If me and you are having a back and forth on text, yeah. so we both know the context, mm. and then you think to yourself, do you know what? I can explain this better as a voice yes. note. At that point, it's like, but you know a random voice note? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. So it's like sometimes I'll send a voice note because I feel like I can express it better in a without voice con- note. Without context, But then I'll yeah. message saying, this is about this, yep. not urgent. Yeah, that's a good point. Like that. I, I like, you're, you're right. And Then uh, it's like, okay, at least I've got context. Yeah, all I'm yeah. saying is that when, when you send or someone or you receive just a 57 second voice note, mm. you don't know if it's an emergency, you don't know if it's not an emergency, you don't know what the con yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. If someone just goes, like this guy who sent me three voice notes, and obviously it's important because he sent a few and I need to get around <laughs> to it, bro. Stop. But like, it's one, yeah. um, he just needs to send me one message and be like, by the way, bro, um, uh, the voice note is just about X. Yeah. Um, uh, it's slightly time bound. So if you could just listen to me, I know. Then I'm not all right. Cool. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I hear you, and um, I should probably do more of that, like giving context to a voice. And note. that guy is you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Just... I know. I do. I know. For no, instance, no, I'll, I'll send you one out ra- randomly, and yeah, a, co- a context sort of text will be good. But also for me, I knowingly send a voice note when I know it's not urgent, unless like it's a weird, weirdly unorthodox time. Whereas like, oh, it is a bit urgent. Like I can only send a voice note. Yes. But I know when I'm. Se- it's almost like sending an email. I'm not going to send an email in an emergency. You'll get to that maybe next yeah, morning. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. Give it to me the next day. Fine. So I, that's kind of how I see voice notes. They're not urgent like that. If it is something urgent, I'll be like, phrasal, like all caps, delete this. 
and so that that's kind of how I see it. And so I wouldn't, I'm not offended when someone like sees my voice note and doesn't say anything because it's like maybe you're bathing your kids or you're washing your car, whatever you're doing something. So that's fine. I, I also think that we've we've become a culture of like phone calls are like the worst thing a person could yeah. do. And I don't like that. I like a phone call. You do, don't you? <laughs> but Check. I don't mind if someone phone calls me at all. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. if I can answer, I will. Uh, and if I can't, I won't. And not going to be funny because I clearly can't answer. I don't feel pressure. But mm. um, I feel like, uh, you know, you see the memes of people like, oh, when someone calls me, it's like, <laughs> why is someone calling? Yeah. But I, I don't mind a phone. Like, I'd much rather someone phone me and like, we could deal with the situation instantly. Yeah. And then is done rather than someone sending me a voice note or message asking me for something. And with a phone call, if I can answer, I'll answer. If not, I'll probably call you back at some point and it's done. Yeah, I, I don't I don't hate uh, calls, but what I what I don't like is and what what I struggled with when I first come to Dubai is like everyone calling me, delivery guy calling me, this person calling yeah. me that call. That I, I dislike. But you know, I don't I don't dislike calls in general, but I do again, like I said, I feel like we're in a time of our lives where it's just like a lot of like rushing from task to task, chore to chore, whatever. I do like that oh I know I've got those four messages in my WhatsApp. I'll get to those like oh at four o'clock I've got some time. So I'll just get to them then. I do like having that. Um but if someone calls me, it's yeah, not that's a ideal. Deal. But I don't end up doing that. I yeah. listen to the voice notes thing. Yeah, and I never, li- never listen to the voice notes. Yeah, I went to a tech event last week. Was that where you were? Yeah. Oh, I thought you were at a property event. No, it was. Um, oh, it was a tech event. Yeah, it was for like uh, the CMS world. Oh, okay. Yeah, <clears throat> and I've been to their events. Same company. I've been to their events in London. Yeah, just London and here, right? And it was interesting to see the the vibe and tone it change. Good. It was good for what an event is. I'm not a huge event fan. You, you like events like- I do like an event, yeah. Tech, you do like them. You've been to a couple of events. Um, I haven't been to a good expo in a while. But you like that kind of, you like to network, don't you? I would like you? to, yeah. yeah I was I, gonna go to the uh, artificial intelligence uh, expo in Dubai. Mm. Um, and I was there to Tertil, I was like, I wanna go here. They're like, nah. All right, that, would, that seems like it would really wrap your Ali. Do you know why? Because um, it, it, uh, expos and stuff are only beneficial, I suppose, if like you have a very clear reason for going or you have someone, someone's there who you want to connect with kind of thing. Yeah. So it, otherwise, it's like a kind of waste of a day. Yeah, it can be. I, and yeah, I, I definitely see that. Unless you're on the scout for like new ideas, yeah. inspiration, networking. Yeah. And but if you're just like, oh, I work in CMS and I want to go to this event for no yeah. reason. Yeah. Uh, there, there was a company wanting me to go to, for something. But when I, when I get there, again, I'm not, I'm not an introvert, I don't think, but I, I think I am. Because when I get to these events, I'm just like, I don't want to network with anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. I, you're I not an ex- introvert. You're probably, an, maybe you're an ambivert. Everyone's an ambivert. Some, some sort of moments Yeah, I don't even know. I don't think... I don't, I'm not. I'm not even sure it really like categorizes people correctly to be honest. Because I feel different, different. I'm uncategorizable. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm above 16 that. Sixteen personalities. <laughs> I'm number seventeen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But I, I feel different in different situations basically. Yeah. But when I'm at an event, um, I I just I can't bring myself just like walk. Oh hi, I'm doing this and that. Really? Because yeah, you come across like you could. I I could, but I just I, just, I don't want to do it, man. I should, I, I, Fair I, enough. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, I just struggle to do that. Um. But I yeah. remember you telling me about this event actually though because it's for, it was for a client of yours, wasn't it? It's so for a client. How, how was the event um, for the purpose that you went for? It was good. They did, yeah. they, this company, I won't mention the name, but they, they're good at events, right? They're a massive company, billion dollar plus company. They run a good event. The food was great. Oh, were you a client of the event creator? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, um, I smell. Yeah, just do my thing. Hey, you know a thing or two about a thing or two. Yeah, I do apparently. Um, but yeah, the, my point being, I've been to their London event and now they're Dubai event, right? right? And it was interesting to see them like um, conform to like local guideline culture, guide, like, culture, right? And this is kind of like you know some people think, say like oh well Dubai or this part of the world is no different from the West or something like that. That's like, but you can see even this this company they'd sit down they'd, they'd thought about okay how can we like you know, um, curb certain things and accentuate certain things so that it reflects where we are, right? A couple of examples. Um, at the beginning, and like the first few speakers that came on, they're all saying like, Asalaamu Alaikum, even though they're right. just like, um, you know, guy from Spain, wherever it was from. Right. Right. Um, so that was interesting. A um, few other things, the slides they were using, they were using more modest pictures, if you will. Okay. Right, purposely modest pictures. Small things like this, yeah. right? Mentioning things about Arabic culture. Okay. Um, but it just, it just goes to show like there is 
a di- like this, this is a massive company, right? If anyone was going to take liberties with it, with it, it would have been these guys because it's yeah. just like pff, whatever. Like we're literally billion dollar plus company. Like you know how like Disney, yeah. Disney they try to set the tone, they try to yeah. set the trend. We're going to talk about this now, and that is the trend because we say it is yeah. these guys could have done that on this sort of micro level. They could have been a bit like uppity about it, but they actually chose to actually you know what we're going to like um, be sensitive to this stuff. So it was nice to see. It was nice mm-hmm. to see because um, uh, it was a, it was a stark difference to how like the London one was. That's interesting. Yeah. Was that the London event that you went to years ago? Or was yeah, it I've, been, I've been there a couple of times. I think I've been okay, to London fine. one two or three, two, uh, twice actually in this one. So yeah, probably. Probably. Yeah, that's interesting. And where was it held? Where was it? It wasn't in Expo City, was it? Oh, here? Yeah. yeah, this time. No, there. Blue Waters Island. That's interesting because I imagine, I wonder what they're going to use Expo. I know they're building communities and housing Expo City, but I wonder if they're going to do more Expos at Expo City. They will. They did one recently. Uh, they did um, COP28 there. Oh, of course. Which yeah, is massive. Yeah, yeah, and actually, yeah, yeah. They, they, this is very interesting. At this event, they'll talk about COP28. The, the company, um, who the agency who like built COP28's like, app and website was there. And they'll oh, talk about okay. how they did it. Nice. In like a summarized way. But interesting, they're actually based here, Free Zone Company. Um, but they got this huge contract to like actually build COP28 wow. and so on and so forth. That's incredible. Um, yeah. And they'll go through like all, like they had like a year to do it. Uh, but obviously things change like yeah. um, for that year. Like, and they basically, they built like, they ended up building, building like 48 apps in one type of thing over the course of the year. Um, obviously the cybersecurity, really? yeah. Cybersecurity was like through the roof. Um, they had to host it on like a local cloud here. All sorts of stuff. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, but yeah, it was a good event, man. It was a good event. There's a really good uh, keynote that I rec- recommend you to listen to watch on YouTube. Mm. And it's um, uh, Spotify, Spotify's marketing team okay. um, doing a um, doing a talk, like a, uh, a, a seminar almost in like front of a live audience on how they um, optimize for like more uh, premium subscribers. Okay. And it's just interesting to see a company who puts probably like hundreds of millions or tens of millions, millions basically uh, of dollars into understanding consumer behavior, how people upgrade in an app. And like, they would just test the smallest of things. Yeah. Uh, like, I don't know, man, I can't remember the the, the, the talk now, but it was like um, consumer, we found that consumers prefer, you know, maybe a button on the top or a yeah. larger button here or the word... <laughs> purchases to buy or yep. whatever it is but they just done tests for every incremental thing mm. the user flow how what's the best thing to show in the user flow and from especially from a person who's like obviously works as an, in an app um it was quite interesting but that's quite just gen- generally from a marketing perspective and consumer behavior perspective it's quite interesting yeah i love that stuff and there's another another agency at this event right they did yes island uh, oh wow the um the like adventure uh sorry what's it called like the um, theme park okay. right, on Yes Island and again like the website registration booking process and they were saying and again sort of perception it also comes to play here right their booking system they had previously people were booking and they were bringing their kids and um, they didn't realise they had to add their kids to the booking mm-hmm. they just sort of subconsciously thought the kids were free or something like that or like it was included in their, their ticket right so people would turn up to the, um, <clears throat> to the to the park fly in turn up and their kids ain't got a ticket right so just like they've got to buy it there and it's like mad expensive now so what I thought, and this kept happening, kept become a trend, right? So this company said, okay, how can we like, f- firstly, we've now got to basically tell them you got to pay more to, to get your kids a ticket, which is not a great thing to ask. So how can we do that, but make the perception that actually, oh, this is great, right? What they did is they just, met, they just started putting out a big campaign, kids go free, right? So kids go free. Obviously, they didn't mention this, but obviously that means the adult tickets inflated a little bit, I, th- I think right, to, to cover that cost, but kids go free. And they kept mentioning that throughout the booking process. When you go on an app, when you go on a website, it's like, kids go free, kids go free. They're reminding them throughout that kids go free. So now, even though they may be paying more than before, the perception is, oh, kids go free. So it's the same thing, they're paying the same amount of money they would have paid had they just added their kids on. Mm. But the perception is that, no, no, kids yeah, are going free. Yeah, yeah. So they turn up now, oh, you, you two adults got a ticket? Great, everyone else is free. So that also gives them, oh, wow, they're free. It isn't, if you, if you break down the m- numbers, everyone's getting paid good money, but the perception is now, kids are free, didn't have to add them. So the booking process is easier because you ain't got to get kids' passports out or whatever to, to book them in. And um, it feels good, mm. right? They said like, you've got to make them people feel good when they're booking it rather than like, 
okay, we've got this bit of a problem. How do we like soften the blow? Don't soften the blow, change the perception, make them actually feel happy about doing this. And that's how they did it. They, they changed that to kids go free. Uh, that, that, that actually reminds me of another thing that I saw, um, which is less about perception and more just about like service. Uh, when I was on one of the flights, <coughs> I watched a Dragon's Den video of this um, guy who, he was basically re, um, uh, what is it, rejuvenating, that's not the right word, uh, the glasses business. But he's basically saying, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so true. He's saying that when you go to an opticians, you have to go, you go to opticians, you get your uh, prescription and stuff, and you wait like two weeks to get your glasses. Mm. And it's just ridiculous. We've, we've, inc we've sped up so much with technology, but yet it's still very normal to wait two, three weeks for glasses. I was like, oh my God, this is so true. They used to always frustrate me. Like, go spec savers, get my eye test, and like, oh, yeah, your glasses were in like two, three weeks. I was thinking, yeah. I always used to think, that seems ridiculously long. Um, but, you know, they say you have to go to, they have to go to the lab, but then the optician has to do or whatever. He was, so his business idea, incredible, was that um, they create glasses in 30 minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah, there and then. And I was like, that's so incredible because it's, it, hasn't anybody had a Jeff Bezos mindset with glasses? And I don't know this industry, so maybe I'm like outdated and loads of this exists. But he, I was just thinking, has nobody, nobody had a Jeff Bezos mindset with glasses, which is how can we do it faster, yeah. better, and be, uh, faster service, better customer experience, um, you know, faster delivery, uh, more accessible. Mm. There's nobody thought about it in the glasses world. That is and so I, um, I've had a similar experience in uh, UK when it comes to like sunglasses and stuff like that. So because I'm, uh, I wear glasses and I don't have, um, I don't wear contacts and I don't have laser, um, I'm traditional. Yeah. You know? Glasses <laughs> yeah. are nothing. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I buy my sunglasses prescription I don't know why that sounds weird. Yeah, kind of like old, old, old fogey. Yeah, yeah, old fogey. I don't always know. <laughs> yeah. I'm, well, I'm you read the newspaper as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 um, but it's a long process, right? Yeah. Uh, and again, I maybe now because I haven't had, I haven't bought glasses in, since what 2021 in the UK. But so maybe now it's like much faster. But my experience in Dubai has been so much more, uh, so, has been so much better since, uh, than my last experience in the UK. I today, um, y while I was waiting for you to turn up to the play center <laughs> with your kids, uh, well, uh, there was an opticians there or, or, or a glasses place there, and um, and I was like, "Yo, do you guys do? Can you put prescription <laughs> in yeah. sunglasses?" They're like, "Yeah," and then I was like, "How long would it take?" They're like, three days." I was like, "That's that's mm. cool. It's not two weeks. Like, mm. I can wait three days." Then. I went to, then I went, when I was going to the mosque in my area, there was another optician there. No, it wasn't even opticians because it was just a glasses. It was just like a sunglasses shop. Mm. And I asked them the same question. They were like, yeah, again, three, four days. I was like, that's quite, like, that, that's so much already I'm like in because I feel like from my experience in the UK, it did take weeks. It does. I think it still does. Does it? it yeah. Does. So it's like I could in theory go in on a <coughs> Monday morning and by Wednesday night, maybe, or Thursday at the latest, have that is brilliant. a pair of glasses. Yeah. That is brilliant. And it feels like you're right. The Jeff, Jeff Bezos moment, or like the Apple, I feel like this is like a, an Apple moment, man, where it's like changing like the whole um, way things, like the way the mobile phone worked, where Apple yeah. did. It's like when you walk, imagine, I imagine. But wait, there's not many industries left that you think, oh, there's space yeah. for Jeff Bezos or exactly. Steve Jobs moment, but glasses industry, definitely there's space for those well, moments. 10 minutes ago, I didn't think so, but now you've said, this yeah. is, you're right, it is. I, I, imagine, I don't know how much it's gonna be to get that machine, right? Or the person who is like the specialist to do it. I know your prescription is whatever, five, you need 5.25 glasses, right? Whatever it may be. I know that, I got that. How, how expensive is the machine? Or can we make that machine like smaller and less expensive to put it into an actual, um, high street optician mm. so that I can make yours in, in, in 15 minutes, right? Yeah. Is it a 50 grand machine? Probably, probably. I'm just- Yeah, we whatever. know nothing about, know nothing about it. Yeah, it's probably a 50, like five million. People are laughing at <laughs> yeah. us right now. So yeah. I have, two, I have two optician uncles, so they were like- Okay, like, ask them about this, right? But I'm interested. Whatever it may be, I think, it, I think the taking that first step, it will be worth it long term. Let's say, let's say it's 100,000 pounds, right? To get that machine and have it in, in store. If you can brand your new optician, it's like, we will, it's all here. You can walk in and walk out with brand new glasses for you in an hour, right? It's just completely changing. It goes from four weeks to an hour. You could probably charge a lot more. Yeah. You get a lot more uh, people through the door. 
and it's like almost self-service now. Well, the thing that was incredible about these guys in Dragons Den is that they were even doing it in a really affordable way. Okay. Not only was it fast, but it was affordable. This is what I'm saying. You probably could, there's a lot of machines where you could take them and like I think it was less down. a machine and it was, I think what you need is a tech, like someone who's highly educated, mm. like he's a technician, I think maybe. Okay. That probably. needs to do it. Probably. You probably need like someone who but knows But again, like you're saying, replace cost of machine with cost. Yeah, exactly. Whatever the cost, cost is. Some sort of cost. Yeah, whatever the cost is of getting it done in an hour, it must exist. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, so I, I agree. Maybe another industry could, like, that could be teeth. Maybe like, I feel like you have to wait a long time to get braces maybe. Or does, is that interesting True. now? It's yeah. Like, how quickly could you mold someone's teeth create the Invisalign or braces or something like that. Can you do it yeah. in an hour if you, if you that, had That's to? a bit of a different one because I know like the orthodontist, that, that literally is like, you need a specialist guide, like literally go in your mouth and do it. So that might be a, like a- No, like but a from the moment that they've done that, just like from a glasses perspective, you have to get someone to do your eye test. Yeah. From the moment they've done the mold, mm. can you, is this, it doesn't mean it's easy, that, but can yeah. someone like make it extremely- So again, in London, I reckon when I got my braces, these have braces, I think I had my mold and it's like three weeks later, I get my mm. braces, right? Probably in Dubai, just cause like things are run better. It's like not, not overpopulated and stuff. You probably would do three or four days. I can I can book a GP appointment for like, I can call them up in the morning and get it for like 9 a.m., you know, or whatever, just like mm. in an hour. London, you can almost never do that. So I think here it'll probably be fine, but that one's difficult because literally you're still relying on, on the human factor. Another industry that is work is worked well in, have you heard of um, Nick Cuba on Twitter? Yeah. MFM crowd. Mm. He did this for storage, right? Like, okay. So he went, he went and bought up all these like old storage places because storage is a great, great industry, right? Mm. Um, people like buying lockers and garages, this sort of stuff. He went and bought all the ones that were like made, built in the seventies and eighties, all the, literally lock and key, padlock, old, you know, eight year old guy still running it type of thing. He bought them and just made it all self-service, right? So there might be one receptionist yeah, cool. just like checking over, but it could all be remote monitored. You book it, you get your key card or your code, you go to the thing, do, 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 all self service, right? No more like much less staff costs, all automated. It feels more premium, it feels more secure. Um, so he, he, he did it that way, sort of making it all, again, sort of high tech and changing the, the sort of experience, but like that. So that sounds good. It doesn't sound groundbreaking. It sounds like this guy's like got a good head yeah. on his shoulders, like, okay, cool, let's automate this. Yeah. But I feel like there's more in, like, it doesn't shock me that there's someone who's like done a great job at storage. Yeah. But I feel like there's industries that, typical classic industries that, uh, like, Kurt, bro, when I came here mm. and I had to get my blinds and curtains put in, All right. um, <clears throat> I, I called the guy and he was like, yeah, I can come at two o'clock, came same day. Mm. I didn't have to book an appointment for him to come. And in the UK, we've had blinds put in our house and it was like, book appointment, come in, like I got availability next week or whatever, right? Guy came same day, measured up same day. And I was like, okay, when can your guys come and fit in? And he's like, no, I can't do tomorrow. Can you do Friday? Mm. Like, oh, like I thought it was like weeks. Like yeah. you're telling me you could do it 40 hours. Of course, it's like 40 hours I had my cousins. Mm. And all in all, I paid maybe 60 quid or something. It's like, yeah. it's just like far, that again, Jeff Bezos is like faster, um, cheaper, best customer service basically and yeah. sometimes what we do is we add too much red tape and friction mm. when it's not needed like sometimes you just got o yes. omar has a really big habit in the business world and i think this is what's led to a lot of his success along but is oh, that he yeah. asked why why not he, he didn't ask why he asked why not so it's like um if you tell omar um like this neon light right uh, and he, he was like, you know, I want to get this neon light done for my company, and they, and and but and, you know, I want it in forty eight hours. Mm. And and they say you can't. The first thing he would say is, well, why not? Why cannot? Like it doesn't mean he's like arrogantly saying like, oh, push all other customers aside. But I just want to understand why why you can't do forty hours. Like, what's the what is the friction there? Yeah, is it there's loads of orders? Is it cost? Is it availability? Like what is stopping us? Because the truth is, is if you put if you said I have a million pounds, but I need this light in an hour, you'd get it in an hour, bro, because you paid a million pounds for yeah. it. So that means that there's 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 some in some ways. So so it's like yeah. but it's a good habit to like keep breaking, keep asking why like a child. Yeah. Because sometimes it's just or it's just because of the norm. Like, um, for example, if somebody said to me today, um, that they want to do a consultation with me, I probably would send them a calendar link that. Is that shows my availability from what we on Sunday Saturday now? Yeah. Probably shows my availability from like Wednesday onwards. Mm. Why? Why don't I just send my availability for tomorrow? Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, the truth is, just because it's norm, mm. for some reason, it's like, well, I don't want to send them a calendar that I have a little bit of a tomorrow. It just doesn't feel like normal to do that. Right. Um, so there's a lot of things that like we just probably do. And think, there's not actually a real reason I think why. some friction, a lot of these big industries, some friction is like, there's a lot of middlemen in industries. Yeah, and, and legal uh, issues are Legal, take. but also just like, a lot of it, uh, kind of like how, when Uber come through, they were trying to cut out the average taxi man. Yeah. Right? There was a lot of pushback. Remember in London at the time? Like, oh, the black cabs. Oh, yeah, I had like, a very passionate Fresh Guy episode about this. Oh, yeah, you did, didn't yeah. you? Oh, I forgot about that. It's the only time Sam and I have ever had an argument. Yeah, oh, wow. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, you know, you know the, the story, right? I reckon that with opticians, for example, there's a lot of like, hold on, you're cutting out this billion dollar industry to do it all in house. Like, yeah, yeah, what does yeah. that come with? So, there's a lot of pushback, a lot of politics, maybe. I thought of another one is like hearing aids. Like, imagine you go somewhere. Because I imagine with AI and stuff, hearing is probably kind of, you could probably do it self-diagnosis or I, like, the AI could diagnose you. You put maybe some headphones in. Can you hear this? Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Yes, no, I can't. Yes, no, I can't. You probably diagnose. Yep, you are hard of hearing. It's a good point. I test the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Really I test, point. they could maybe cheat. I mean, you could cheat with that. Yeah, you're right. I test could do the same thing. But now we're talking about, so we're cutting out op optometrists now. We're cutting out like yeah. hearing those now. But it probably will come down to that anyway at some point. But um, yeah, you could do that. It's like the AI diagnosed you. Yep, you only heard 40% of the sounds you should have heard. You're hard of hearing, but don't worry. We've literally on the shelf next to you, we've got um, our brand of hearing aids and they're, they're perfect for your situation. They're fine-tuned for they're your- They're fine-tuned yeah. for your situation. Uh, you just sync them up to the dock and it adds your settings. That's it. You know, and it's literally, you could, you, could, you could probably do that without even talking to a human. Yeah, and then you go to your electric house. <laughs> 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 and then, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean- and Your guard dog is charging. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah there's probably uh, it, it's interesting because as technology you, know, you sometimes you think oh um there's not much space for innovation um but then you remember that because technology is constantly evolving there's always space for innovation but how do you feel about this human concept because what i just said there there's a it, there's definitely industry people hearing that and just like panicking like I, well I, that's I, my that's I'm my pro. impression i i think i'm pro as well but yeah. is that is that, <laughs> is that you and me being absolute like no, no, i see why <laughs> Because I'm a pro these guys losing their jobs. Yeah. No, 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 it's not about losing jobs. Yeah. And I, 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 because I, I'm not pro people losing jobs. That's not the case. What I, but, but, but if, if technology is shifting, things are going to shift eventually anyway. Yeah. What I'm saying is, is I don't believe that people will lose jobs. And yeah. I think Naval Marx says that. I can't remember who said it. But the point is, is that I don't think people will lose jobs. I think the types of jobs people have change. Yeah. And people have in fact, better jobs. Yeah. Like the person who's an optician now or optometrist who tests people's eyes, if that gets automated, he's that person is probably not going to lose a job, but that probably person might have a, an even even better job. Mm. Uh, or, um, but like like what they do, uh, like how they use their skill because it's always going to be, it will change. They might be something going on with management level. It might be something like they go into, like for example, an optometrist doesn't just, um, uh, doesn't just, test eyes for people to have their prescription they also check uh for um diseases in yeah. the eyes and they have to recommend uh, people to hospital and they, mm. they they help with stuff like diabetes and so they have a vast array of skills i don't think they're going to necessarily go out of a job um when um uh but, but i think people will have like higher skills for example like yeah. in a, especially in generations there might be a short loss of uh jobs which yes of course i'm not pro that but in the long term, like for example, you it know, you itself, know, people yeah. in supermarkets, um, there's now um, automated checkouts. For the, what does that mean for the next generation? For the next generation, it probably means that there's going to be like more engineers because there's more things to now engineer. Mm. There's more products to work. So, that, do you know what I mean? Yeah, you're right. And I think it was not virus. It's something similar. It's like a hundred years ago, the vast majority of everyone's population was a farmer. Yeah. Right. Farming, uh, rearing animals, that kind of thing. Right. And then, like as technology automated a lot of stuff. That same argument was made, but technology created more jobs. Yeah, it, yeah, it created more jobs or different jobs. So it's, we haven't got people walking around now. It's like, oh, my, my grandma used to be a farmer, but now I'm jobless because they changed. Right. But no, things change. Instead of farming, people become whatever engineers or they built the tractors, whatever it may be. You know. So you're right. It, 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 there may be a short term loss of like direct figuring employment. Figuring things out, yeah. Or figuring things out. Yeah. You'll just if, again go with the optometrist thing. You'll be the person who trains the AI, or you'll be monitoring the AI from remotely, or they'll, they'll refer them to you for whatever. Also, normally when there's a massive trend going one way, there's always the pendulum swings right back round, and then there's like a massive reaction the other way. Mm. So um, you see it online with like stuff like um, there was like the hyper feminization of males of men, yeah. like 
a few years ago. And now there's so much content of the high part, high part, or just like promoting masculinity in men. Yeah. So it's like, there's such a big rise in that where it would have been like so um, uh, unpopular and uh, controversial to, 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 to argue that or fight that. But now yeah. it's like <clears throat> so cool to be like, no, men should be masculine, right? Yeah. And so, um, so, so, so for example, what was it going? So, um, even like when Sam and I had that discussion about the black cabs versus the Ubers, he was quite passionate because he has friends who are in black cab, mm. and he, and he saw people like feeling like they were losing their jobs, yeah. which of course is like a very sensitive. Uh, uh, it's great that he was so sensitive and empathetic to that, and it's a very real thing that happened. And yeah. I'm not, I'm not like brushing over that. But he he came to me like years later. He was like, "Bro, like I actually conceded in the argument. You're right." Mm. And the point wasn't that I was right. The point was that um, I you was got right. You got the W. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I got the W. Yeah. Um, but bro, like uh, in in that you see like a massive shift as well. Where it's like now it's like yeah. bro. It, I went to London, bro. There's so many black cabs. Yeah. But now what it is, is interestingly, is that it's like a luxury yeah. to be in black cab. It's like there's Halo and all these other that's like yes. promote black cab. It's like, oh, there's all these private cars and Ubers. How about you get black cab? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And, but it took time to get to that. Yeah. And I'm sure people still have been affected by the Uber shift. But the Uber shift is going to happen anyway. But what's nice is, is that there's still like this huge... Um, demand for black cabs but like people saw that and they were like all right black cab drivers are losing their jobs just uses as a way to like promote like and get more jobs for black cab drivers and stuff like that yeah and again a bit of perception change in there they change i mean change black, perception yeah, yeah it's like it's become a luxury it's a premium it is, thing yeah now. it's like it's, cl it's traditional exactly uh london kind cabs. of almost reminds me of like when, when like horse and carriage changed the car horse and carriage was used for like weddings oh you get, yeah. oh, you get a horse and carriage like the the princess is coming in a horse and carriage because like the old thing it used to be for the commoner becomes premium as well so um i love no, when, these when henry ford made cars um like he 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 he, he um kind of like turned cars into um being mass produced through factories yeah i'm sure there was a lot of worry in the horse and cart business yeah mate they're the up, agency they're up in arms. Arms. yeah up, oh <laughs> i've heard stories mate yeah. um but bro they're galloping all over the place about how many millions of jobs have been created because yeah. of cars yeah, because yeah. of the mass production of cars okay, yeah it, that's that's a very good example of them just like naturally moving and, and being fine and being better and horses still exist I love horses yeah. we, we're not against horses in this podcast at all no. you've actually ridden horses recently. so have you mate i've seen a video have i oh is it donkey oh i've that video, that so funny that, video that you That paid. was a mule. Oh, right. wow. Yeah. Okay. That's half donkey, half horse. Wow. Is, it, is that what a mule is? Half donkey, half yeah. something. Yeah. 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 I've ridden a mule in my time. Yeah. Listen, yeah. riding a mule is a risky business. Oh, it was uphill as well. Yeah, I saw it. It looked like a, on a cliff, man. It was a cliff. A it was actually the Moroccan uh, Atlas Mountains. Wow. How was that? I didn't know you went up there. On a mule. On a mule. Muled it up there, yeah? For a very small amount of time. Maybe Fine. five minutes. And yeah. then I give the mule back to the man who's actually riding the mule. Hey, have you ever driven a car up a mountain or across a mountain? It's kind of scary. No, but that does sound horribly scary, yeah. In, in the Cypress run from, there's like, this. they fix it now because it's more like, but it used to be like a section where they didn't have a fence either. So it's really? like, literally you're driving, it's like, you can see down a mountain, man. It's not great. Charge yeah, trauma. that sounds, yeah, no, no. I, I've seen videos of that kind of stuff. But that yeah. looks very scary. It wasn't, I don't think it wasn't as bad as that. It wasn't like you literally like, one, yeah. one, but it's like, you can just look and see, oh, that's, that'll kill me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've, 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 I have I've been in those kind of scenarios where it's like you're on. I, I think I've like maybe. I feel like I've experienced perhaps something like that, like being on like a. Oh, that was it. It was in when we were going up to when we were driving in. I think it was Morocco. We were on those roads, those kind of roads. Yeah, but yeah, it wasn't like like you say, it wasn't like the like typical. Oh my gosh! But yeah, uh, we did go on those kind of like hilly mountains. It's like, whoa, there's a mm. job there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was, you wasn't driving; you were being driven, innit? Oh, I was being driven. Yeah, <laughs> I would not be driving. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Scary. Uh, yeah, that would be rough. A rough drive. But um, yeah, I got some relatives who, who didn't want to go over like a bridge. I like, you know like the big Queen Elizabeth Bridge. Is it Queen Elizabeth? QE Bridge, in sure. London. That big bridge. What's it called? Oh, East London. London Bridge. Oh yeah, no, not that one. Yeah. There's another one. It's like East, like Dartford Bridge. No, not Dartford Bridge. Barking? Anyway, man, what that big okay, bridge. Fine. Cause like it's kind of tall and stuff, but I was alright on that, so maybe I'd be alright on a mountain, I don't know. To be to be confirmed. Yeah. Let me know if you have a little mountain. I'll send you a voice note when I'm up there. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just do it a couple weeks later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, guys. This was Freshly Grounded, uh, episode uh, 351. Hello, I'm back. Uh, of Freshly Grounded. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, Kaya, I shall see you soon. Inshallah. Jazakallah for having me, bro. Jazakallah. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum.